let's get started with uh, today's final webinar on uh, self-supply. And I'm going to start by introducing people, um, starting with myself. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Kleemeyer. I'll be your moderator today. And I've also been the task manager for this uh, webinar series. Um, Kristen and Army are our support team. Uh, Kristen is making this whole thing happen, and Army is there to help you in the technical chat box. We have our great facilitators, um, perhaps the most important people next to the presenters and the discussant. Uh, Kirsten is, and Sean, I believe, they're probably sitting right next to each other somewhere in Switzerland. And our discussant, I'm very pleased that we've finally been able to get Yitbarak to um, participate in these webinars. He's a very busy person and hard to get a hold of. Uh, he's sitting in Addis Ababa uh, right now. So, um, And then, of course, our most important people, perhaps, today are Sally, who's sitting somewhere in the UK, and Andre, who is also uh, sitting somewhere in, in Switzerland. So before I tell you more about them, let's find out a little bit more about you. I can see that some of you have been introducing yourselves, so that's great. If the rest of you would just tell us a little bit about where are you from. I see some of old friends are back. Laura from Calgary is uh, back. Fatum Fatumata, um, one of our regulars, is here. Oh, hello, Mark in DC. Kenneth in Utah. I don't think we've ever had anybody from Utah before. And Claire in Shropshire, I don't know really how to pronounce that, in the UK. Colombia, yes, Rafael is another one of our friends. Kiran is another, oh, we're getting a lot of our regulars here, plus some new people. I don't think I've ever seen Jana from Leipzig before. That might have been my, um, my problem. Marianne from Montreal, well, that's really, really good. Now, um, glad to have you all here for our final one. Oh, and, and our friend from Dar es Salaam. Um, uh, Kristen, could I ask you to tell us a little bit about what our statistics are in the webinar series? Sure, Liz. We have, as of today, uh, 1,331 participants registered for the web uh, webinar series. And today in the webinar room, we have, at the moment, about 50 participants. Back to you, Liz. Right, and I'm sure that will uh, arise. I've, I know from other times that we um, continue get to get people that will join us in the webinar throughout the first 15 minutes or so. So we have a uh, poll question for you today, and we're already looking forward to some possible future webinar series. So if Kristen, if you could bring out that poll, and what we're going to ask you about today is what kind of scheduling or what kind of rhythm do you want for webinars? Here comes the poll. I can see it. Yes, there it is. So um, if you could look this over and tell us, well, what do you think is the best way to organize a series like this? Is it um, to have it every day for a very short period of time, like for two weeks, or to have it maybe twice a week for five weeks? Or once a week, that's of course what we've been doing over a very long period, then just have it once a week. Or we could have it less frequently and, and go on for even longer. Or, or some other option. If you want to you know, give us your thoughts in your own word, please, um, please feel free to do so. And I can just tell you what the um, people are thinking. Well, OK, so I can see that this format we have of sort of once a week is, is very popular. Some people think maybe that's a bit too much. Once a month um, would be better. OK, a little, bit, a little bit in favor of the more intense for a shorter period. Well, um, we will certainly keep that in mind when we're looking towards the future. So uh, Kristen, you could take this poll away now. And um, let me get on with um, introducing the people today. Um, the, um, I always have to. I always lose my um, concentration for a minute here as I, I'm shifting through my notes, trying to find my <laughs> the notes I've made on our presenters' bio. So here, I've, I'm finally back with you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Sally. Sally was introduced to the technical and social complexities of rural water supply as a hydrogeologist and social scientist during a four-year postdoctoral research in rural Oman in the 1970s. 
After 14 years in the Middle East with international consulting engineers, she moved on to work in sub-Saharan Africa, initially for the Zambian government. Since then, she has worked widely as a consulting consultant on planning and evaluation of rural water supply projects and on policy and strategy development. This has been combined with long-term action, action research into a range of technical management and financing solutions in rural water supply. From 2003 to 2011, part of her work has been as the self-supply theme coordinator in RWSN, aiming to get self-supply and ex its acceleration more widely recognized and taken up. The role of coordinator has now been taken up by Andre. Andre's professional background is in rural engineering and business engineering, with more than 17 years of experience in consultancy and project management of infrastructure and environmental management project, projects in the fields of water supply, water resource management, environmental management, regional development, and policy development. Within RWSN, he acts as thematic coordinator for accelerating self-supply. In this capacity, he has been involved in various activities, such as the development of the strategic framework for the self-supply, for self-supply in Uganda. Boy, I'm getting real um, appreciation for those BBC announcers who can read out things so naturally. So with my bumbling introduction over, um, Kristen, could you take away my slides and bring out the presentations that Sally and Andre will be making? So, uh, Sally, over to you. Actually, I think perhaps Andre will start off and follow. Yeah. So, good morning, to, good to Andre. Morning, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I also would like to welcome you to this joint presentation. In my part, I will focus on the background of self-supply and explain briefly the concept of accelerating self-supply. The GMP update report 2012 has highlighted some successes and achievements with respect to access to water in rural areas. But the same report also stresses the fact that there are still millions of people without access to an improved water source, particularly in sub-Saharan African countries, which are indicated orange uh, on the map. Solutions for improving the situation for these people without access will very much depend also on their capacities and the context they live in. In order to develop appropriate solutions, we think answers, uh, questions should be answers such as what is the context these people are living in, what are their priorities and capacities, and which approaches are promising to improve their situation. This picture from Zambia shows a typical, typical situation in rural Africa where access to improved water sources is uh, scarce. The context is a rather remote area with a scattered population. We see the family well of, of family uh, Chalve in Luapula province. It's an unprotected well. We see no cover, poor lining, no prune, no cover. Even the lifting device is very simple. And as many families in rural Africa, family Chalve lives from uh, subsidence agriculture and they do not have regular uh, cash income. This moment I want to introduce the concept of the water ladder. The water ladder in illustrates increasing levels of water supply technologies and levels of services for water supply. On the lower level we find affordable technologies but they are often uh, unimproved, like unprotected springs, scoop holes, or hand dug wells. All these technologies are affordable for the end user. And uh, this is exactly the type of uh, well and water source we have seen in the previous picture of family Chalway. So their well is on the lower level of the water ladder. On the higher level of the ladder, indicated with the blue steps, 
we find so-called improved sources like hand pumps of various types or even pipe schemes. The higher you get on the ladder, uh, obviously the, the better the service is, but also the higher the investment costs and also the operation maintenance costs and the more complex organizational support is needed. How can the access to the for the population be improved? Is there only a one-step approach to improve this uh, situation in terms of water supply? We are convinced that the approach of incremental improvements of water sources through user investments, which is the definition of self-supply, is a valid option to improve water supply in many contexts in a cost-efficient and sustainable way. On this slide we see the water ladder with examples of technologies from Ethiopia. These technologies reach up from very uh, simple pumps up to motorized pumps. But self-supply is not covering only water lifting devices, we also talk about rainwater catchment technologies or technologies for water storage or household water treatment. Technologies along the ladder can serve one household, many households, or even a community. And the sources used by self-supply can be for domestic use or both, both domestic and productive use, which is very often the case in Africa. Major benefits from improving water sources through self-supply include better access to water sources in terms of walking time, uh, waiting time, but also in terms of quantity of water, quality and reliability of the water source and the service. The concept of self-supply sh shows clear links and synergies with other approaches such as the CLTS approach used in sanitation with multiple use uh, in agriculture and it is a complementarity to community water supplies. Self-supply is not a new approach, actually. It's uh, practiced in many countries for centuries, particularly in Asia. There's a lot of experience. We have seen a huge need in, uh, in terms of improving water sources in Africa. So why there's only little in initiatives visible in terms of self-supply? And the answer is the households in Africa are facing various challenges to overcome this situation and to start improving their own water sources with their own financial means. Key issues are access to unbiased information about appropriate technologies, which means just having the information which technology is available, which is feasible and appropriate. Further access to provider or the, the supply chain is difficult whether it's local masons or welders. Sustainable financing and support mechanisms are lacking. One approach to overcome this could be revolving fund schemes, but definitely there's also change in attitude needed. Um, many projects give technologies and services for free or with a lot of subsidies, and this is definitely a an, an, an topic which has to be considered when introducing self-supply. And finally, the last point we mentioned is uh, the lack of capacities and mechanisms to establish a self-sustaining support system for the self-supply uh, for the self-supply initiatives. On this slide, we present four cock wheels which from our perspective are uh, necessary to keep a self-supply process moving. They include improved and appropriate technologies. It's about support of government policies which should be in place, sustainable funding mechanisms on local level, and the fourth cock wheel is the enhanced private sector skills and capacities. In order to keep the whole mechanism working, there is need for advice and technical support from outside, and this needs also funding. 
and to uh, facilitate this process it would be an uh, advantage to have standards in terms of, res uh, of technologies and this is also linked to research to develop these technologies and standards. In order to introduce such a process, four, four steps are basically needed. And during these four steps, we have uh, various actors in various roles. The key, the key concept of self-supply is that the households or communities are the demand side and the private sector is the supply side. But to introduce and to start this process, also government and NGOs play an important role. The first step is about the strategic planning for self-supply acceleration. Here the government is uh, in charge to identify potential, uh, to create awareness and inform about the approach, maybe to pilot models. The second uh, step is the establishing uh, and modifying of enabling policies and regulation, which is definitely uh, the role of the government and the regulator. And then the third the step is actually the planning and then implementation of self-supply, which means the households want to invest their resources and the private sector provides products, services, or spares, is in charge of operation maintenance. But also the service authority, maybe the district water officer, they have also a role to play like documentation, information, capacity building, of uh, the private sector, for example. The whole process needs monitoring and coordination, which is also part of the government role. This concept is not only a nice slogan or a theory. Similar approaches for self-supply have been implemented by governments in various countries also in Zambia and northeastern province, in Luapula, where the family Chalve lives. And as mother, other families in the region, this family has benefited from this approach and they have improved their well with their own financial resources. As we can see, the same well, but definitely improved, a prune and lining, cover, lifting device. So it's not only about theory, there's really impact on the ground. So far that's from my side and now I want to hand over to Sally Sutton and her part she will highlight the potential and limits based on evidence from studies and piloting. Thanks very much Andre. Uh, good afternoon, morning and evening to everybody. Um, Mr. Cholwe is a good example of the lower levels of self-supply acceleration but he can reach higher too. But the main question is are there enough Mr. Cholways to justify a complementary approach to conventional community supplies? Research that we've been carrying out over the last few years through RWSN has found that many millions of people in, in rich and poor countries alike have, have become impatient with the supply to which they have access and have invested in improvements of their own to it. These improvements are helping to fill the gaps in public service delivery and reduce pressure upon it, but are largely unrecognized by the sector. Using JMP statistics for a rough assessment of potential in sub-Saharan Africa and groundwater use as an example, in total the JMP shows about 170 million depend on their own unprotected groundwater sources. Sample countries shown here show a wide variation in the numbers of people affected uh, who are using unprotected traditional sources. So that's those people in their left hand corner. But overall, about one third of these people have water within relatively easy reach so could be encouraged to upgrade them to provide a reasonable supply. For example, um, in Mali, 
There are over 200,000 traditional wells owned by individuals, shared with neighbours. One well for about every six to eight households and represents a private investment from people regarded as the poorest of the poor, over $20 million. These are convenient and usually unpayable supplies. Zimbabwe has gone a step further and has a similar number of family wells for a slightly smaller rural population, but initially largely through government-led initiative, around 150,000 such wells serving over 2 million people have already been upgraded beyond JMP standards uh, and therefore have shifted into the protected supplies rather than listed in the slide. And in these, those people who have upgraded um, have covered 80 to 100 percent of the cost themselves. Such changes probably start off quite small scale, but soon neighbours copy each other and the effects spread fast. And in this way, large number, numbers of people can be included. From this table, maybe countries such as Nigeria and Ethiopia have enormous potential for such an approach, but it is something that is relevant to almost all countries because families appreciate the convenience of their wells. And they're keen to invest in them if they have adequate knowledge of what they can do. They also need adequate support services, as Andre has mentioned. Such services are beginning to emerge, as can be seen on this slide. But with sluggish growth in rural economies, their development and demand generation needs speeding up in sub-Saharan Africa, probably more than elsewhere where it is developing more naturally. So here, uh, this becomes part of the acceleration progress that process that we're talking about that the private sector needs strengthening and markets to be developed. Demand's not difficult to generate as the benefits are easily identifiable. Uh, this is an example from a study in Ethiopia carried out recently with reports showing findings in two regions where people have invested in their own initially primarily for domestic use. On the left-hand side, the SNNP region, um, where the, the districts surveyed were relatively poor. Here, having a well and the convenience and time and energy saved helped move people who initially were 82% with insufficient food for the year, almost all now having uh, sufficient food for all the year round since they dug their own wells or dug for For a few, there is the beginning um, to be an excess to their, their needs. Selling. But in, in Oromia, which is a slightly more developed rural economy in the, the studied districts, having a well nearby has moved people into more productive use more quickly. And the addition of a motorized pump and so small irrigation has allowed half of them to begin saving and investing in further development. But even without any element of irrigation, there is a major move people from sub-subsistence to subsistence and above. Alongside these more economic benefits, it should be noted that two-thirds of families um, who own wells in SNNPR identified improved health as an outcome of having their own well, even though the well is unprotected. Because the convenience and having more water in itself provides health benefits and better nutrition. 
beneficial effects were also identified in childcare and school attendance, which rose with less water carrying. So the benefits are very obvious to families on the ground and to their neighbours. But for governments to support a new approach, they need to see benefits to the public sector, not just to users. This slide is mainly to show the intersectoral nature of such benefits, and I'm not sure how well you can actually read them, but um, they're well spread out between the sectors. And this, this, this there is therefore relatively um, easy to gain the interest of more than one ministry in a drive to accelerate self-supply. As a result, the piloting that was carried out in four countries and has previously also been carried out in Zimbabwe um, has found that it's not always the same ministry that will take the leading role for promoting the acceleration of Zimbabwe and Mali, the Ministry of Health started the promotion um, and the training of artisans and the promotion of household water treatments. Whilst in Ethiopia and Uganda, it's been the ministries responsible for water supply. And it's included rainwater harvesting as well as groundwater. But in Ethiopia, um, there, apart from the Ministry for Water, energy, there has been a growing input from the agriculture and health sectors. In Zambia, it's been a combination of the two from the start. But the main lesson learned is that inter-ministry cooperation and coordination is usually quite easily achieved at district level, but more difficult to establish at higher levels until there's good evidence on the ground. And also that Different strategies are needed for different countries, and it's not uh, simply a one-size-fits-all approach. In the left-hand corner are the main concerns of the water sector, uh, some of them at least. Um, and piloting and research have been carried out on these, but unfortunately there's no time to do more than a quick look at the one which most preoccupies water sector professionals, which is water quality. Um, as the rapid assessment for drinking water quality has shown, no technology works perfectly, but risks reduce as one progresses up the ladder. The question is how far up the ladder can people afford to go and what benefits that brings. The piloting of low-cost wellhead improvements such as that of Mist of Chorways um, affordable even in poor rural areas and can lead to significant improvements in water quality. Here there are the results from a monitoring of 60 wells improved in similar fashion to Mr. Chalways at the expense of the owners. Um, and you can see that initially before improvement only 17% of wells had zero tolerance. This rose to 72% were made. So not all results are so extreme, but in every case that I've seen, uh, all show some significant improvements in water quality with levels of upgrading. Um, also, the, the growing belief in household water treatment. So small changes can have a big impact. And as a Malian health technician said to me while observing a muddy scoop hole, we're not lo looking for perfection. We're looking for progress. Self-supply implies a realism that some improvement is usually better than none. So finally, I'd like just to summarize from the two parts of this, of this presentation what self-supply is not and what it is. Acceleration is not a substitute or a competitor with community supply. It just makes it easier for those who get impatient with unreliable, inadequate, or non-existent public supplies. 
be able to fill the gaps and to do so with a better standard of product and a wider choice of options. It's not a cop-out for government. When we say largely user-financed, it doesn't mean government can wash its hands of any financial implications, I suppose any more than it does for the maintenance of community managed supplies. Government still has key roles to play, as Andre pointed out. It's not an advocacy for low standards, but for progressive improvement from what people already have. And it's not equally applicable in all areas or in the same form. There are plenty of areas where it's not suitable to look at well upgrading, or it's not suitable to promote rainwater harvesting. Making these options available to all, and even advice boreholes for richer people, and promoting household water treatment to all means that some elements of cell supply will be relevant to most people. But what is it? It is also really an additional strategy to augment inadequate services and reduce pressure of demand on them. It can help in the drive for universal coverage that we're providing support to those who are within the set, who are most difficult to, to reach, the ones that are becoming more and more expensive to reach as coverage gets higher people in scattered houses, hamlets, remote areas, and so on. And it, it enlarges the market for private sector services, which are already being built up to serve uh, community-managed suppliers. And it helps them, therefore, to be more sustainable. In a small way, it's an additional source of funding when, when sector funds for construction rehabilitation and maintenance are inadequate. So in Africa and all over the developing world, there are people trying to solve their own problems for water supply, and some who've got a bit further than these people. Um, but this number are growing all the time, quite dramatically, with existing rural water supply strategies. So we must look to additional approaches, such as accelerated self-supply, to offer them ways to progress. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much to both Andre and to Sally. Um, if you could take away these slides now, um, Kristen, and bring back the moderator slides. I will uh, move on to introducing our discussant to you. Our discussant is Yit Barak, who has been with the bank for the past. Let me get you to Yit Barak's picture. Yes, that's Yit Barak. Um, has been with the bank for the past 15 years in various capacities, in urban and water unit in Africa. Prior to coming to the bank, he worked for the Addis Ababa city government and for a construction firm in Ethiopia. Yit Barak works on both urban development and water and sanitation in rural and urban areas. He leads both bank um, and the joint IDA DFID funded projects in the Ethiopian portfolio, which is valued at over US $500 million. He has also worked on the Eastern Nile development project and in Malawi and Uganda. I'm very pleased that we were able to get Yit Barak today. He's a tough guy to track down and get some of his time. Um, but uh, let me turn it over to you now, Yit Barak. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, um, good morning and good afternoon, Professor Nafu. I won't add much into the next presentation we made earlier because it's obvious that the benefits uh, from uh, self-supply are huge both social and economic benefits. I just wanted to reflect on some of the challenges and to pose a couple of issues for discussion. I think it's agreeable to say that it's 
I have to rule of uh, technology options. This is one of um, the various technology options that has been said in the water ladder. With a need for upgrading and then recognizing some of the features this uh, self supply would have. Uh, have you said this actually as introduction? I would really like to add some couple of uh, bullets to, re to reflect on the benefits to add and the benefits already listed by our uh, previous uh, presentation. It's definitely an incentive, obviously an incentive uh, to use improved source because it is closer to the user, household, family, and all small groups of uh, settlers. Especially in rural settings where there are small group of families uh, settling in scattered manner, they will have a short distance for fetching water and also benefit from the time saving. The single family ownership for multiple use, it, it really will ease uh, source management. One can use uh, effectively and efficiently. The source, because it's self-managed for both domestic use and also multiple use, including uh, oh, small scale irrigation. Yidvari, can you hear me? Yes. It's Kirsten. Yes. The, the, it's, the, the sound quality is not great. Is it possible that you move the microphone a little bit further from your mouth? I think it's maybe just the microphone is too close. It's We're really all struggling to hear. Could you just do a little uh, test again? How about now? Uh, that's it. Just try a little. I'll uh, moving it a little bit further away. No, is it okay? Uh, it, that's better. I think if you also really talk slowly, there's something. The connection is not as good as earlier on. So just try to talk very slowly, and we should catch everything. Really sorry for interrupting you. Sorry. That's fine. Then I I I start back again from the second slide in terms of talking about uh, added benefits from uh, self supply. Am I sounding good now? That's a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's obviously an incentive to use improved source for families, especially in a settlement where small groups are living in scattered matter manner. They will have better access to uh, a source and also management. Particularly when it comes to single family, it really empowers the single family to manage its source for multiple use, for domestic water supply as well as small scale irrigation without any potential conflict on source. There's increasing number of schemes, so it's, it's uh, a potential for uh, achieving targets set by government and also NDGs in terms of access to safe and potable water supply and also sanitation as it goes in, in integration. We have to really uh, appreciate that is an existing approach traditionally in many of the countries, there are traditional ways. But what we need to add is these new features in terms of making sure uh, they are sustainable uh, and making sure that they are of good quality. This might require in some instances in some countries to really go back and revisit the arrangement for subsidy because there are some goals potential with potential for subsidy in, in, for capital investment. And also we have to recognize that it can be designed around lessons from success. Uh, as Sally mentioned earlier, there are experiences in various countries. In one of the regions in Ethiopia, this has been tested in different manner as a campaign for providing family wells. In 2004-2006, there was this experience in this region of constructing about 84,000 family wells. But unfortunately, that didn't go any further. Uh, and, and then there, there haven't been much of a lesson compiled to learn from and really make use of it for um, ensuring quality and also making sure we can really build on what we have learned in that particular region. So there is a need, I would say, to really uh, compile document uh, success and failure uh, experiences. 
this, this, this uh, success, this uh, benefit won't happen uh, actually without uh, a challenge. There are lots of challenges, as Sally indicated earlier. Uh, if I mention some uh, that might help in really raising some discussions, in particular, if I give example for, uh, about Ethiopia's policy for subsidy, there is this subsidy policy which is which requires 10% contribution from colonial scheme management uh, committees. Whereas uh, under the current thinking in Ethiopia, there is a tendency, maybe it's an agreed upon uh, arrangement to subsidize uh, these semi communal uh, schemes up to 50%. So that requires really a, a, a detailed uh, uh, review of the uh, subsidy uh, strategy arrangement and policy. Also, still many beneficiaries with broader sector programs is an issue. In, in most of the countries in, in the region, uh, there is this sector development program, which brings all the minerals of ocean for technology in the water supply provision together and then try to really approach the sector in a programmatic approach. So streamlining this particular uh, technology and approach into that programmatic approach is something that really needs uh, some effort and challenge. Coordination is another major challenge in, in many, in many uh, countries, I'd say, because uh, the multiple views requires in, in attention, interest from water, agriculture, health, as I mentioned by some earlier on. It really is a challenge to make sure that these groups are coordinated at all levels. The experience tells that at a very decentralized level, it's easier to coordinate these institutions, sectors. But as you go higher up, it's, it's getting a bit difficult. We have, we have challenge in terms of making sure that sector coordination really uh, takes place effectively. The number, as I mentioned earlier, increases dramatically number uh, and then that really demands commercial capacity to monitor to update the inventory and make sure that all the sources are really of acceptable quality and some other monitoring elements they require the really capacity at a local level creating demand itself is another uh, challenge in, in, in and with the local stakeholders creating demand both uh, at household level really uh, needs a lot of awareness creation, promotion, and the benefits. And also, uh, one has to factor in the capacity, affordability of households to really contribute to the subsidy level indicated earlier. So that itself is an issue, uh, uh, because we are in most cases dealing with communities uh, that are with low uh, income. And in some instances, in many instances, I would say, are not even able to pay for the tariff set for the communal water supply. So one has to also factor in the economic aspects of affordability of the beneficiary, the targeted beneficiaries. Another uh, challenge and also risk would be with the acceleration. There is a chance unless really carefully designed, structured, and then with a lot of upfront capacity building, orientation, promotion uh, activities of campaign mode, a quota mode. This was what has happened in, in the example I indicated earlier in 2004-2006 in one of the Ethiopian regions. Those 84,000, about 84,000 family wells were constructed in a campaign mode. And then a quota was given to the low-level administration heads to achieve those quota. So achieving quota was not a problem, but maintaining quality and making sure what is being constructed is really of, of, of acceptable uh, standard was an issue. That's why it didn't sustain, and, and then I think we have to really make sure that all the capacity building initiatives that were mentioned earlier have to really be taken care of front. Uh, last but not least is uh, really we have to make sure that this is really overall engagement is cost effective. And 
if, it, even if it's cost effective, you have to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that it is affordable for all, at least for most of our beneficiaries. These are the challenges and they require many interventions, many interventions as indicated in uh, Sally's presentation in terms of the challenges, the benefits, so a lot of um, interventions uh, have to be uh, undertaken up front. So what it takes to really make sure that there are, it, 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 it builds up in success. Includes some of these uh, these points, like we need to really strongly support the revision and updating of sector data and strategies. We have to really have a baseline. We have to make sure that the sector information is really adequate to to make sure we are monitoring it uh, adequately and effectively. Enhanced dialogue is really important between different stakeholders uh, at all levels because it requires involvement of a local private sector as a provider, involvement of household as a beneficiary, community as a beneficiary, and government to take a really large stake, if not totally within the, the, the whole initiative. Creative demand, as I said earlier, in building capacity of both public and private providers is, is, is something that needs to be really in place in order to to, to, to achieve whatever he wants to achieve through the uh, self-supply. Ensuring integration and coordination between the various sectors, health, education, water, uh, agriculture, for multiple use of the self-supply, and also really to really make sure the benefits are shared among the various beneficiaries is important. Altogether, all this has to be monitored at the end of the day to really make sure that we are going in the right direction and, and then achieving the, the required result. So the issue is bringing all this together, making sure that we are not complicating what we are trying to achieve in the process. How can we ensure simplicity in the process? because we are dealing with households and small communities, I think simplicity should be a, a really a major point. So the question would be, how can we ensure simplicity for the same goal? Achieving really household level benefits from input water supply? Would it be okay to single out self-supply or would it be good to really make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that it is an integral part of the, the process of uh, overall sector improvement? Coordination happening in many aspects, so it's a matter of making sure that coordination includes this technology as one option in the government program. So why do we single out and we treat this separately, particularly uh, with the risk of uh, making it a campaign when we talk about really accelerating. So I think that is the issue we really need to discuss about in terms of why singling it out, why it can be treated as a, as, as, as a part of the government's program, and as we have in almost all countries, a sector program that will cater for raw water supply at the community level, at the decentralized level. And in the context of it, maybe some other countries as well, why introducing semi communal scheme where we have the community water supply schemes that have really similar nature in terms of managing the schemes effectively and efficiently. So why do we introduce and make uh, the, the process of really uh, developing sub self supply particularly for semi-communal schemes uh, in the introduction. So by way of making sure that we are streamlining what we are uh, building here with the government existing systems, I would say we can uh, simplify the whole approach. So it would be better if done with, with an existing system. So finally, I would say the benefits from self-supply are obvious uh, and then the challenges as well. So with this, I would, I would really uh, thank you and, and then open it up. Uh, thank you very much, Yitbarak.
Um, I'm, I have to apologize to everybody. The, the, the sound quality from Ethiopia is not very um, good, but there's not really much we can do about it. I do thank Yit Barak for moving the microphone a little bit farther away from his mouth. That certainly helped. But uh, Sally, when you're answering questions, could you also be sure to speak directly and, and maybe move the microphone into your mouth a little bit more because we were also getting fading in and out from you. So now we'll move to the question and answer period. Um, our two facilitators have been tracking all of the questions that you've been posting in the chat box and sort of staging them behind the scenes so that we can um, bring them up. Please continue to post. Uh, by the way, somebody has not muted their microphone. Uh, if somebody could mute their microphone, whoever is talking. Um, so uh, now, uh, Kristen, if you could bring out the question answer box, and I will turn it over to Sean and Kirsten to uh, read out the questions one by one and uh, direct them to um, whoever is the most appropriate person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and, and thank you to, to all three of you, Andre, Sally, and Yit Barak, for your, your very informative presentations. We already have about 13 different questions, but please, everyone, keep typing in your, your questions um, that we can continue to add them and group them. The first question that we have, um, we're going to ask to, to Andre. And please, between you, Andre, Sally, and Yit Barak, if you feel that somebody else is more appropriate to respond to the question, please just pass it on or ask them to augment. Well, we're trying to kind of um, guess who, who the best person is for your question. So the first question is really talking about the links between self-supply and sanitation marketing, Andre. Um, Enrico points out that self-supply is similar with sanitation marketing. We should consider the demand, the supply, and the enabling environment. And Chris Siremet Sir from CRS later on pointed out that it seems to be there are links with this and CLTS and FAST with a strong private sector. Would you like to add something to that? Over to you, Andre. Thank you, Kerstin. Thank you, Enrico and Chris, for this interesting question. Yes, I uh, would like to answer or give at least some of my thoughts. Um, definitely, uh, there, there are similarities between sanitation marketing, self-supply, uh, although maybe one is from sanitation and the other from rural water sector, but I think there this, this clear uh, boundary we, we um, should overcome this somehow and look more on similarities what we can learn from sanitation. Uh, I think sanitation marketing and CLTS is very much about um, stimulating demand through different ways and how I uh, understand the sanitation marketing in the CLTS is about working with the element of exposure of, of um, individuals within the community. It's about the element of shame uh, when we talk about open defecation, improving the, the situation. On the side of self-supply, it's less on, on exposure and shame. I think it's more about presenting uh, and, and highlighting benefits and what people can see from neighbors as, um, as motivation, how they move on. So I think there are a lot of similarities which we can learn and which we should share. Uh, in, in terms of um, sanitation and CLTS as, a, as an approach, I think there's another level we can uh, learn a lot or think about, which is the whole aspect of impact on, on the health uh, within communities. And uh, it's, it's well known and documented that uh, health and hygiene education, and in particular hand washing, has a major impact on reducing diarrhea in communities. And if you talk about water quality, I think we, we should also keep in mind that hand washing has maybe the bigger impact on, on health states in terms of diarrhea diseases as uh, maybe the water quality, which doesn't mean improving water quality is not a topic, but definitely we, we uh, should uh, consider both. That's from my side, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is, next question is to you, Sally. 
And it's regarding one of your slides which had data for different countries. And Wahid uh, from Nigeria uh, doesn't agree with the figure for Nigeria. And Woody Collins asks what the source for the, the, the data is for the, the chart. Thank you. Uh, the data is from the JMP uh, 2012 reports. Sorry, it was supposed to be written on the bottom of it, but it seems to have fallen off the end. To you again. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much, Sally. Thanks a lot. You were so quick at answering the question. Um, and we'll put the GMP link on the chat so that you can pick it up, Wahid. Um, next question to, to you. Ah, you copied the question there, Sean. <laughs> Let me put the question down. Um, this is around water quality, which is always a very big discussion point um, with respect to self-supply. And um, one of our regular listeners, Fatumata, um, is asking, um, in Mali, for instance, approximately 5 million people take their water from traditional wells within 100 meters of their house, but the majority of these traditional wells are significantly contaminated by microbes. What interventions have been so far put in place to raise communities' awareness on this um, and linking that to, to self-supply? Over to you, Sally. Uh, thanks very much, Kirsten. Thank you, Fatimata. Um, I don't know how much, whether you have a wider amount of data for the traditional wells in Mali than I have, but we have done um, a survey of I think about 200 of them in which 80% actually had less than 10 thermotolerant coliform per 100 mils, so were remarkably uh, low contamination in many of them. Um, the interventions that have been put in place are, are usually uh, are mostly from the Ministry of Health, uh, who are working at the uh, with the district officers and the um, health management committees to make people aware of what precautions they can take, both in terms of wellhead protection, storage, and household water treatment. I think that answers. OK. Um, thank you, Sally. The next question is for Andre which I will just paste in, and it's um, from Wahid in Nigeria, and he's asking about the rural urban classification, as his experience in, uh, uh, in Nigeria is that it's rather haphazard development makes classification difficult. Over to you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Wahid. Uh, I'm actually not very much informed about the classification of rural urban in Nigeria, but definitely there are people in Nigeria working in self-supply in the area of urban rural, like Grace uh, Uluwa Sanja of uh, the university in uh, Abeokuta. But what I want to highlight here is not that we only focus on self-supply in, in rural areas, um, there, the need definitely is very high, uh, but we know from many applications of self-supply also in uh, urban setups and also in Nigeria, there the issue of monitoring evaluation in terms of water quality impact is definitely um, even more relevant, but still um, there's a potential and there are practices and I think we, we should learn about these technologies which are used to uh, better support this, uh, this approach and somehow monitor what is going on. But in terms of classification, if you want to need more about this, uh, World Bank has some uh, literature and uh, in any other countries I think rural urban issue is defined differently, so um, there I think are, are many of our participants today uh, around who could maybe answer this question better than me. Back to Sean or Kerstin. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Andre. Um, the next question is less of a question and more of a, a kind of point to, to Sally about your slides. And there was quite a few comments from the audience about your slides. Um, David Baguma really likes the ladder illustration about progressive improvement in water quality. And Fairwater was a little bit concerned that one of the slides with all the circles was a little bit too many interrelations. It was a bit difficult to understand. I think there's a lot in that. And I'm not going to ask you to, to explain that now, but just a bit of a comment back. I'm going to hand over to the next question. I'm going to hand over to Sean. Um, yeah, the next question is to you as well, Sally. So if you want to comment on those slides, feel free as you, you also um, reply to the next question. Thanks. OK, Sally. So the next question is about hygiene, where uh, Linda asks, uh, will interventions took place to improve water quality? Was hygiene education included? Um, and can, uh, to have a great and does it have a great impact on health? Thank you. Um, I think hygiene education in relation to water was um, sort of carried out on a regular basis in the areas for which in, in Zambia it was in fact the environmental health technicians who were most involved in promoting the improvement to wellhead protection, but they would, as a matter of course, in their duties, be undertaking the education at the same time. So I think it, that would have been done both in the places where the quality, where the protection had been improved. Thank you, Sally. Um, next question is in relation to the private sector. Um, we're going to put this first of all to Andre. And um, uh, yeah, a number of points here. Mr. Shamsuddin, who is also a regular um, participant, um, asks to, in to introduce acceleration in the process of self supply, a healthy supply chain needs to be in place. Capacity building within the entire range of the supply chain is a determining factor. And obviously, the private sector and the local level and formal institutions need to be given utmost importance. So what's your opinion, especially around the private sector and the informal sector? John Noggle, um, having worked in technology transfer for the last 25 years at Enterprise Works, we found that the biggest challenge is creating the capacity in the private sector to respond to the demands from households for low-cost improvements. And Chris um, agrees with John and asks, what suggestions can the presenters offer for creating a private sector that can supply technologies, including spare parts? So over to you to start with, Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Abu, John, and Chris. Uh, very challenging topics, uh, I'm fully aware. Um, the, the aspect of supply chain, in particular in remote areas, is definitely the, maybe the most challenging aspect um, to keep that supply going. From my point of view, the private sector is, is one of the key parts in this aspect, as I tried to mention in my slides. Um, therefore, any approach to to further develop this approach should be developed together with the existing local private sector, um, whether they are more informal masons or welders, or whether they are retailers in local trading centers. Uh, I think in, in terms of building up a viable supply chain, well, we, we really have to think about uh, maybe voucher systems, um, uh, support from government and NGOs to build up these supply chains to uh, improve skills of the private sector, give specific training uh, so that whether the supply chain or even the, um, yeah, the taking up of responses from, from the demand side, from households, can be improved. We can also think about stimulating demand with radio uh, spots in the local areas where we can um, inform the households about the, the uh, 
capacities installed within the private sector. Uh, there are approaches like the Shippo shop in Tanzania where you can um, install some kind of retailers with training and with uh, label which assures the, the, the population that at least the, this type of uh, products or producers will follow a certain level of quality. That's not a silver bullet approach, I think, but some, some elements from case studies we have which we can share, which we uh, would like also to follow up how they work in different settings. Um, the same is about the, yeah, I also tried to respond on the question how to stimulate the demand from households. Uh, the radio I mentioned already, I think definitely we, we have to introduce in this uh, concept also local leaders, traditional or political leaders. Uh, it could be an important effect to um, allow potential uh, clients to visit demonstration sites, not only within uh, the compound of the district water officer, but maybe close neighborhoods, neighbors who can then respond on their experiences and show what they can get out of this um, technology in terms also of income and uh, other benefits. I think this is also a very strong trigger. So this is from my side and maybe others could add some comments. Thank you. Hi Sally, did you want to add anything to that, uh, what Andrew just said? I, I think just looking at uh, some of the problems that have come up with piloting, uh, an, a, a, an important point is what roles are taken by governments and NGOs that can help to build up the, the supply chains but at the same time need to try and do so in a way that doesn't make them indispensable. I think that certainly in Ethiopia, for instance, there has been a move by to, to try to get rope pumps established, but in a way that meant that government rather than private sector became a driving force, and this actually led to probably more problems than it was solved in some ways. So I, I think also with NGOs and who like to be able to bring in things but not necessarily uh, and then it's difficult for them to step back. So we need to try and strengthen private sector through sort of commercial and the dynamics of marketing which um, John has mentioned as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, well, the next question is, is to you, Sally, which is about groundwater. And uh, Linda asks, uh, while the water ladder is clear, the problem of putting a motorised uh, system in a well for hand pumps might have an effect on lowering the groundwater faster and possibly affecting other nearby hand pumps and wells. And I'd uh, like to know your, your experiences of, of that situation? Um, well, I'd say firstly that the motorised pumps that were, that were being referred to were mainly very low yield ones by my standards. Um, <laughs> I would say they were yielding only slightly more than a permanently pumping hand pump. And the distance between wells is such and the storage of the aquifer is such and the recharge that I think the effects in most cases are relatively small. Um, but the, the, the point really to make maybe is that the, the domestic element of self-supply is still a very low quantity of water and it's not that that would be affecting the, the groundwater resources as a whole. But it is a concern that needs to be thought of much more if uh, irrigation becomes a larger element of the supply provision. 
Thank you very much, Sally. Um, let's go to our next question. Um, I'm going to put this first of all to Andre. It's around household water treatment. This is a very general question, but um, um, how do these communities or how do communities perceive water treatment? And I know there's a whole water treatment network that, that's looking at this. And um, the guest, which is actually Jake Carpenter in Uganda, um, points out that promotion of point of use treatment and creation of supply chains could be a good complement to any accelerated self-supply initiative. Over to you, Andre. For Thank you, Hatumata, and uh, hi, Jake. Hi, guest. Um, definitely, I want to highlight the fact that there's a, a, a household water treatment network, um, network which is only focusing on this topic, and uh, they definitely will have a lot to say on this. But um, as I mentioned, for me, the household water treatment is one part of the self-supply, uh, the scope of self-supply. It's not only about water lifting, for example, uh, although this is definitely the first step. But I've seen many examples where out of the, let's say, the empowerment of, of communities or households, which started with improving the water sources, later on they, they also invested money in improving the water quality, for example, um, by purchasing uh, biosand filters or other devices. Uh, it's then about the, on the one hand side, on the priorities and of the, the households and also of their awareness. And there we come back again to the question of hygiene um, and, and health uh, education and sensitization. Uh, but I think we should see the, the, the self-supply approach not only focused on one technical option, but as the chain of lifting water, storing water, and also treating water. Uh, therefore, I fully agree that this, this is something we should uh, cover and consider comprehensively. I give back to you, Kathleen. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is to Sally, and it's from Rahel, who asks, uh, the community prefer better service when uh, funding from government is available. So in such a case, how do you promote self-supply? Thank you. Um, well, I think in some ways it, that's an, um, an easy answer because if the community has um, available funds from government to make a supply, then those people will first go for that supply uh, if that's what they want. But Self-supply, it, it's not um, an either-or. It's, it's as if you have, um, you, you have a, a system that is there that people can call upon it if they feel they want to do more than is available to them. So if somebody has a community supply, but they find that they are waiting several hours, or they don't like the taste, or it's a long way from their house, then those people should be able to make use of the enabling environment that is building up um, as part of self-supply acceleration to solve their problems and provide themselves with a supply which is more to their liking if they can afford to do so. So um, to me, you, you make it clear to people that they can come to government and the private sector for advice on how to improve their supply. Um, and that, as Andre mentioned, the sort of the four pillars, the availability of loans to people who want to improve, uh, the private sector which is better capacitated to provide support services, and a range of technologies that people can go to. So as, as long as people have a good community supply, which they prefer, there is no reason for them to look to self-supply. Uh, the two are complementary, not in competition. Thanks, Sally, for making that absolutely crystal clear. Um, we now have a kind of, it's a bit of a conversation that we've pulled out that's been going on in it 
it's around kind of subsidies and also goes to the mobile phone, one of your topics, I know, Sally. So this is also back to you. Um, Mike McCarthy points out that subsidies can be a tricky issue in self-supply. And have there been any key lessons learned regarding subsidies from RWSN's work in the focal countries? John Noble points out that concerning subsidies, I think that we should all consider cell phones, which were never subsidized, but which are widely used in developing countries, even rural areas. What would have happened if they had been subsidized? Perhaps there's a lesson there. And he talks about the market value of a product. Um, now, David Baguma from Malaysia um, points out that subsidies can be good, particularly when supply in kind, and that they've done some very interesting work on that. And Chris, um, who asks, well, what's the trigger? How did cell phones become so widespread? And what will it take for sustainable water supply and sanitation systems? A lot of wide questions there, but maybe something on subsidies and also on cell phones. Over to you, Sally. Help. Uh, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I think as far as subsidies are concerned, what we have seen is that you can um, get major improvements to water supplies even among people who appear to have no money at all. Um, if, they, if they see that there is a real advantage in it. And in Zambia, the, one of the poorest districts in the country was taken for piloting. And there, people responded. Initially, there was no response because people expected that everything is brought to them. So it's necessary for there to be a major change of attitude. And the major change in attitude comes when people see a value for themselves in something. And I think this is how cell phones came about, um, have become so popular, partly because of the value and partly because of status. So people recognize that they are um, able to gain something from having a mobile phone, whether it's information, uh, friendships, the price of wheat, or whatever. Um, and at the same time, they have a better mobile phone than their neighbor, so they, they can be seen to be one up on somebody. So I, I think John knows more, even much more about this, but unfortunately we can't link him in. Um, but I, I think that it is, as he says, that the value of the, the product itself that is important. And but we are finding that you can certainly do these things without any subsidy, but it takes longer. So the question is, uh, are you going to set up a system with no subsidy, which means that everybody starts at, uh, on the same level? Or do you provide some subsidy, an incentive of some sort, to speed things up? In Zimbabwe, I think they just provided um, a lid for the family wells. And um, I think otherwise, people were expected to provide all the bricks for lining, the windlass, and so on. But the small incentive of something for nothing did move people more quickly. So um, if, you don't, if you have a subsidy initially for demonstration and so on, you have a, a plateau time when people um, don't respond when you, re when you remove the subsidy. And having the subsidy reduces the number of people that can be um, covered. So I, I think there are a variety of, of issues, and it's something that would need to be discover, discussed in each country and for each case um, on its own rights. Thanks very much, Sally. Um, Yit Barak, I think you had your hand up earlier. Is there something you would like to add? And Sally, could you put your microphone to mute, um, please? Yes, uh, it, it was, it was uh, as the other one has been responded. Very slowly. Sorry, if you, could, if you could just put the mic a little bit further away again and speak really slowly. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. 
it is uh, the, as far as I can move it. Is it okay now? Barrack. Yes, that's a little bit better. Very okay. slowly, and if that, at that speed, will we should be able to hear you. Thanks. Okay. On, on the subsidy issue, uh, I would say benefits at making people aware of the benefits of getting self supply, getting the services as closer as possible, as well as empowering them, the, the, the empowerment it provides them when they are deciding on the use of the water source itself for multiple uses, is one way of really making sure that people will be willing to pay for the service improvement. So it's also a combination of value, benefit, and also status. People would like to be seen as if they have a healthier family uh, from amongst the neighborhood. So that makes it really uh, attractive for people to really do it with a less or no subsidy as, as, as it goes along. But the disincentive, I would say, with regards to subsidy is if really in deciding the subsidy level, we are making some mistakes or differentiation between the community, as I mentioned earlier, and the semi-community schemes. You may, you may, you may see the advantage uh, some of the hydro location, geographic location would bring to some of the community by way of really ease for getting uh, family wells easily, while others do not have that access. So balancing the equity between those that, uh, that, that are really gifted naturally because of a low level of uh, the water table to get water easily, and those that are really not uh, favored by nature because of their settlement in a very arid area, and then they are required to really invest a lot for water source development, is a consideration we should make when we think about the city. But plus for really private sector capacity building, subsidy level determination, I would see the family, the household, and the small community to play a great role. So changing the attitude and also making sure that there is a substantial and sufficient consultation with local private sector and households will make those private sector capacity building as well as the subsidy determination easier and maybe uh, to the extent the uh, families can afford. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much. That's great. Elizabeth, do we have time for one more question? I know we're very tight on time. Do you have one very, very short one? We have one. Oh, we, we've got plenty more, but let's pick one that's maybe a little bit different from the rest. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, particularly in relation to middle-income countries. Um, a question from Steph Smith. I'm sorry it's so small in the box. Um, excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> sorry about that. Um, Steph Smith asks that he can see in some countries where coverage is relatively high that the last 10 to 15 percent may be covered through self-supply, such as in Latin America. But these po in these populations tend to live in very remote areas, so they're hard to reach. I know Morocco also has a similar issue. And these are exactly the type of market conditions where self-supply is actually difficult to, to generate. Um, do we know anything about experience of self-supply in middle-income countries? And Steph points out that he thinks that Andrew did some work in the Ukraine on this. Is there something he could sp expand on? I'm going to hand over to this very difficult question to, to you, Andre. Thank you very much, and sorry for my cough. Thank you, Steph. Uh, it's really a challenging question. I am not sure if, if the conditions in Latin America are particularly difficult, because I would assume at least you have some vibrant private sector. You have uh, experiences with microfinance. Uh, I could imagine that well, with some specific promotion and triggering you can maybe get and approach some of this uh, last 10 to 15 percent. Just to, to mention in Bolivia there's a lot of uh, activities going on in particular remote areas where this 10 to 15 percent uh, will be reached. It's, it's the EMAS um, concept which is very popular there and I think uh, um, there's more around that we know. And Unfortunately, Ukraine, it's true I'm active there, but the government is not very open to this 
approach for the moment um, mm -hmm. and not very open for other approaches. But and maybe to close here uh, and to add at least one one last sentence from my side, I would be very happy if all the participants today could provide us as the network with some experiences you have from Asia, for example, or Latin America, so that we can share this and um, disseminate this, whether it's on technologies, on microfinance or water quality, this would be great. And with this, I thank you very much and hand over back to Elizabeth, I think. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for, um, as always, a very uh, grueling question and answer period. I know how difficult it is to facilitate that and to come up with the answers to all of these tough questions that our participants ask you. So the um, recording of today's webinar will be posted, if not by this afternoon, then certainly within 24 hours. Um, as I said earlier, if you have one of our emails, you have this green button that will take you to our web page, or you can Google us to find not only the recordings, but the uh, PowerPoints and other background documents. Uh, Sally has been particularly um, good at providing us other background material on this subject, which you will find on the web page. So thank you to everybody, um, Sally, Andre, and Yit Barak, and of course our facilitators and backup team. Um, this is rather a sad moment as we uh, come to the end. And But I particularly want to take the, uh, a minute to thank all of you. Um, some of you have been coming back week after week, and we certainly appreciate that. But um, we also appreciate anyone that pops in from um, just for a, a webinar or two. Uh, Kristen, could you post in the chat box a link to our water blog? Um, if you'd like to give us some feedback on what you think about this webinar series, and if you'd like to see more of this kind of thing from uh, the World Bank, uh, Kristen will, has posted this um, link to a, a blog here, and, and that will accept your um, comments, um, which will eventually be posted there. So it's a way for you to um, talk directly to World Bank leadership and tell them um, you know, what you liked and what you didn't like about this uh, series. So I'll certainly be interested in, in reading that as well. Otherwise, um, goodbye Elizabeth, for we now. We have um, yes. a question. One, okay. one massive thank you to you, everyone who's here in the last minute and a half that we have before we're cut off. Yeah. This would never have happened without Elizabeth. So if you've got hands to clap, please, a massive thank you to Elizabeth and her team for making this happen at all, because really. And many people are asking about the next series of the webinar, evaluation of the webinar. Anything you'd like to say, Elizabeth? Sorry for uh, the difficult question. <laughs> well, I mean, right now, um, there are no plans for a, uh, well, certainly not for a future one uh, focused on rural water supply. Um, the World Bank, um, sometimes despite its reputation, is actually very responsive to its stakeholders. So if you express an interest for something, and I again direct you to that blog link, um, then that's sort of the best way to influence what happens. So um, I, I encourage you to post your comments there. Anything you guys would like to say? Anybody want to come? Anybody that has a microphone want to come on and say a last a last word because we're we're actually out of time now. So goodbye for I'll I'll sign off. Goodbye for now. And any of you that want to have a last word, please do so. Well, I'd also like to um, thank everyone who's been involved in this series, and particularly Elizabeth and, and and your team for doing such a fantastic job, and for helping to raise the profile of of rural water. And uh, I hope that we can do this again sometime. OK, thanks, everyone. That's from my side. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kathy. Still time, I'd just like to say I think it's a fantastic way for everybody to get together and to raise really important issues. So thanks to all those who made it possible.
Thanks for me to read back. Really, it's really, uh, it was really important, and then I would see all of us contributing forward to this important uh, uh, initiative. Thank you. Bye.